So I'm Andy King. I'm also from Ohio State. I'm going to try and uh, bring us home here so we can uh, stay on time. Um, so step four, and before I start, take a deep breath. We're going through an entire 320-page book in 20 minutes. So I know this is a lot of information, um, but hopefully you, know, you can uh, have the slides to take with you and have a little bit of a, a summary on, on what's going on with uh, Kern's framework. So step four. Um, educational strategies. So what does Kern talk about when, when he, he refers to educational strategies? It means the content, so what you're going to cover in your curriculum, whether it's as simple as a, a, a curriculum on treating strokes or if it's an entire residency didactic curriculum uh, based on the, the EM model. Also, also the methods, how are you going to deliver the, the material? Is it a flipped classroom? Is it a TBL? Is it a lecture? Is it a podcast? Is it an interactive small group discussion? Is it a simulation? Is it a procedure lab? The context in which you're going to deliver it. Is it just a small group discussion? Is it a larger, larger session? Is it a small workshop like this? Or is it a, a big plenary session at SAM? And then ultimately the learning environment. So the learning environment is, uh, is not only um, the group of people that we have <laughs> together, the size of the room, the climate. Are people going to fall asleep because it's 80 degrees? Are people going to be freezing and want to get the heck out of there because it's 60 degrees? So you have to keep all of that in mind. Is it the optimal learning environment for your learners? And that's not only climate um, that we say temperature-wise and room-wise and, and learner-wise. It's also you want to set a climate that, that is appropriate for your learners um, and nurturing for your learners to learn. And all this is based on adult learning theory. So how do adults learn? I mean, we're all adults in this room. We're all continu continuing to learn. Um, adults learn based on um, concepts, broad concepts and principles. And they like to um, use their previous knowledge on a, on a topic and add to that knowledge. And they like to do it in a method where they're, where they're solving problems. So really choosing a learning strategy that's going to um, use this. And then really focusing on a, a self-directed learning, which we'll talk about here in a, in a future slide. But uh, self-directed learning is, is really important for adults because it allows them to, to really focus on where they're, where they're weak. And they can focus on that and really um, concentrate that and, and take some less time on the stuff that they're really strong at. So you want to use multiple learning methods. And it's really important to think outside the box because you really want to really identify the best way that you're going to deliver the content. Is it a small group session? Is it a simulation? Is it a lecture? Is it a problem-based learning or a team-based learning exercise? And then you want to choose methods that are feasible in terms of your resources. So for example, if I want multiple small group discussions for our large residency that we have at Ohio State, I need to make sure we have faculty that are able to, to facilitate those discussions. Whereas if I'm giving a lecture, I only need one faculty member that can deliver a lecture for 48 residents. Same with a simulation session. Do I have enough faculty that can, that can proctor a simulation session? So you want to really make sure that you choose the right type of um, educational modality for the resources that you have, namely being faculty time, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So step five, implementation. So this is where you're really starting to take all of the nuts and bolts, and you're going to really um, work to implement this within your, within your program. So how do you do this? So you want to obtain departmental or institutional support. So if that's a residency program, you're going to um, talk with your residency program director and say, I got this cool idea for a curriculum. Is there room for it in the, in the um, overarching um, program that we can implement this? Maybe it's an undergraduate medical education initiative. Do you need to get the permission of the, the dean at the, at the medical school? Or is this something that's uh, CME related where you need to talk to um, the CME coordinator at your, at your institution. And you want to secure resources. So resources, you know, the first thing we think of is, is monetary um, in nature. But in the vast majority of times, and I know um, we have this at Ohio State, and I'm sure many other people do as well, that, you know, the biggest resource is faculty time. And a lot of time, you know, we don't have the, the faculty needed to teach some of our sessions. So that's another thing you want to make sure that you secure is the uh, right amount of faculty time in order to deliver the content. And then you want to address any barriers. So one of the biggest barriers, uh, we, we implemented a, a big curricular overhaul now about four years ago. And one of the biggest barriers that we um, had was 
We had a, a curriculum that was working. P residents were passing their boards for 30 years. And we wanted to implement a flipped classroom model um, for our didactics. And the residents didn't want to do it. The faculty were, were resistant to it. So how do you overcome those barriers to really educate um, both faculty and residents who are resistant that this is a literature-based model that is effective? And then ultimately, after you've done all, all of the work in steps one through five, um, at the same time, simultaneously, you want to introduce and administer the curricular components that you design. So in implementation, I like to use the um, Cotter framework and leading change. And I've kind of starred um, some of the steps up here um, that, are, that are important. So you want to form a powerful group that's going to um, help spread your message on why this curriculum is important. You want to create a clear vision for change that you can clearly communicate um, to the stakeholders involved. You want to communicate the vision effectively, and you want to have everyone on the same page so they can communicate that um, cohesively. And then I also highlighted number six, which is create quick wins. So when we uh, implemented our um, overall um, new curriculum, we had, to, we had to do it in steps. So I had to, I had to get little tiny wins in regards to presenting literature to faculty at faculty meetings, um, having uh, pilot sessions with our residents in order to show them that it's effective. And when you combine all of those small wins, you get a large win in the implementation of the curriculum. So step six. This is uh, one of the most important steps, I think, in, uh, in Kern's model. Second, maybe, to goals and objectives. But evaluation and feedback. So did the learners learn? Did they like um, how the material was covered? Were the curricular goals met? And then basically, there's two different kinds of evaluations you can do. There's formative evaluations, which are basically done throughout the course and throughout the curriculum. Did the residents or students or learners like the material? And do they feel that they were learning? You can also assess this um, via various assessments. Um, like Megan and, uh, and Brad presented in the uh, um, team-based learning activity with uh, different assessments throughout the activity. You can also do summative evaluations, which are given at the end of the curriculum to determine if the objectives and the goals were met with, for the curriculum. And then, importantly, within step six, a successful curriculum is continually developing. So this is why step six is very important. You want to make sure that your curriculum is not, does not remain static. You want to make sure that you're continually evaluating this thing and make sure it's a living, breathing organism that is going to continually improve and evolve to meet the needs of your learners and your educators, for that matter. And I like to split steps. So step six, uh, current also includes dissemination. I like to split that into a separate step because I think it's also very important. So reasons for dissemination. So there's multiple reasons. Number one, it helps with providing evaluation and feedback to your materials that you can get from an outside, um, unbiased reviewer. It helps increase collaboration. All of our time is very valuable. It helps minimize redundant work. You know, a lot of times we have the same ideas. Someone might have already done it. So why waste your time when you can collaborate with someone else? and use that and build upon it. And then also, it's one of the, it's one of the ways that educators achieve recognition for, their, for the hard work that they do. There's certainly uh, med-ed research, but a lot, a lot of times it's the curricular development, the day-to-day -day teaching that we do that we often don't get recognized for. And then together, you know, we can create the best sort of uh, environment for our learners. This isn't a one, one man or woman show. It's collectively, nationally, as, as educators, we can put our minds together, put our materials together, and we can make the best opportunities for our learners. So quick recap. We've got uh, six, maybe seven steps, depending on how you look at it. We've got problem identification. We've got needs assessment. We've got goals and objectives. We've got educational strategies. We've got implementation, evaluation and feedback. And then I separate in... Step seven, dissemination. So like I said earlier, I understand this is probably how you're feeling. WTF, what's going on here? 
This is a 320-page book in 20 minutes. I understand that. We have all of our slides. Hopefully we distilled it down for you in a, um, kind of a short summary that you guys can take with you and, and hopefully implement at your shops. Any questions? accreditation for CME for faculty like any of these activities could be a CME so don't feel like well this is just resident education because this is what the ACCME is looking for we just went through a whole accreditation at our institution and they want team-based learning and all these little things and you can use your needs assessment as your gap analysis and your objectives and people kind of stress like faculty when we have them fill out these forms for ACCME but I mean, your chances are you're meeting everything you need to meet. You just need to, like, document it and ask for CME, and I'm sure you could grant it. So I, I know a lot of you are familiar, but just to mention that. Thank you for mentioning that. And it, when, you, when you publish um, stuff on curricular development, a lot of times the, the journals are looking for a Kearns model um, and, uh, as a way to, to present the, um, the study. Um, so just that's something to keep in mind as well. 